Hello, hello, hello. Thank you guys once again. Uh, any newcomers who have not heard the initial speech of what this all is. This is uh, the ATX Game Makers South by, unofficial South by Southwest uh, party. This is our social lounge. And <clears throat> just a quick spill. Sorry, out of breath from running around. Uh, just a quick spiel. ATX Game Makers is an organization that is a focus on increasing the diversity in the games industry. And so we do this by way of mentoring, <clears throat> mentoring, uh, mock interviews, portfolio reviews, and uh, just in general helping people either get into the industry or start making their own game and becoming a part of this industry. And so uh, pretty, pretty fortunate to be partnering up with the folks at Worst. And so this is the worst collab, so that's what this part of this building is. And so what they are is they provide um, NFT and Web3 solutions, and like they're one of the forerunners in that space. So if you definitely have some questions, definitely need to hit them up. And then on the other side of the building, they are uh, worst, uh, worst, uh, I always, yeah, I always get that part wrong. <laughs> yeah. And so what they do over there is uh, like Google Cloud services, but a little bit more. So they also offer like data migration and all of those extensive services. So definitely hit up the worst of folks if you have like any of those technical, super technical needs. But without further ado, I'd like to introduce Manji. He has been in the games industry for over 24 years, currently working at Zynga um, on the uh, game Star Wars. Star Wars Hunter. Hunters, which I totally did not forget. <laughs> and so I will let you have the stage. Right, cool. Give it up for Donald, man. Um, thanks for the intro, yeah. Uh, so the talk is gonna be called uh, Opening Doors, Diversity in Video Games. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about some heavy topics. Uh, there's gonna be some stuff uh, that we uh, hit up early on. Um, so, uh, just a sort of a heads up on that. Um, Alex, you next slide me, man. Yeah. All right. So a little bit about me. Um, I've been in the games industry for a long time. Uh, 24 years. I started as a game reviewer for the Sega Dreamcast for IGN. Uh, I reviewed uh, Spawn, Soul Calibur 2, a bunch of other stuff for that game. Uh, I left game reviews when I was uh, not allowed to rate a game zero. So uh, don't pay for game reviews. That's my lesson uh, from that bullet point. So um, I've done a lot of stuff in the industry. I've done QA, I've done game production, I've done engineering, I've done design, I've done art. I am definitely the worst at art. I encourage you to try all the disciplines you can, mess up as often and frequently as you are able to. So uh, another part of sort of my work experience is that I've worked with huge international corporations with EA and BioWare and currently Zynga. I'm on a team that's got like teams in uh, China and the UK and Poland and all these other places. Let me see if I can blow this mic out even harder. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'm just gonna sort of talk about uh, uh, what's the sort of journey that I've been on in the last few years and I hope I can share some of my knowledge. Oh, right off, leading off with the thing. All right, all right. So. Uh, yeah, so uh, in 2020, uh, George Floyd was killed by Minneapolis police, right? A lot of us saw the videos. A lot of us may have been out on the marches. Um, it, was, uh, it was a time. It was really scary. Uh, next slide me, please. And uh, I am somewhere in that Austin American Statesman photo of uh, uh, folks out at Houston Tillotson University. Uh, and uh, I got to talking to a lot of folks while I was out there because it was sort of a thing that you did. And it was a time where I was really open to having some harder conversations. And I was told something that was really hard for me to get over. If you could next slide me. That, uh, that bothers the shit out of me. Um, it bothers me really bad. And um, I was told by a lot of different people this idea that like, you've got to kind of look like me and you've got to have a college degree and you've got to do all of these things to make video games. And it's not true, y'all. It just, it isn't. It really isn't. So um, my next thought was, uh, what can I do about it? Right? Like when you're, when you're faced with a really significant problem, with a really big kind of social action issue, what do you, what do you do? Right? What do you as a person do? And what I landed on for me was, uh, boot me again. Sweet. It worked. Sweet. Um, 
So a system that I call opening the door, right? Right now, a lot of people don't even know that the, the, the door is closed to them. They don't even know the door is open. They don't know the door exists. So the best thing I can do with all my years of experience and all the people that I can talk to is to make those paths a little bit easier, make that door open a little bit wider, make it just that easier for people to come into our industry and make fantastic games so I have fun stuff to do when I retire and stop doing all of this. Uh, next slide, me. Point, we'll do a point? All right, we'll do that. All right, yeah, so um, I want to start off with careers and education because I think this is a place that people tend to get confused or tend to get some wrong ideas about. Um, so the most important thing in video games is the stuff you've done, whether you're an engineer or an artist or a designer or a producer, the titles you work on, the titles you ship are way more important than anything else way more important than what school you went to, way more important than your GPA, way more important than if you have a GED or a college diploma. The stuff you have done, that's the important deal. That's, that's it. And when I go out and uh, talk to schools, so I've spoken with high schools and elementary schools, I've spoken to colleges, this is a thing I wanna reinforce a lot. At every stage of your life, as you're learning, as you're growing, as you're developing these skills, it's easy to get caught in this trap of, I have to have you know, this master's degree to get this job. I have to get this uh, 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 certificate program to get this job. That's just not the case. It really isn't. Uh, sweet. Um, it did not go. There we go. Uh, another thing I want to talk about, um, this uh, is a program that I've started to use uh, really recently at my current title uh, in Zynga. Uh, I work directly with Europe, but there are other opportunities. These are programs that uh, young people, especially those who maybe don't have uh, uh, college access, who maybe don't have uh, uh, quite a lot of resources, these companies exist to partner up those people with uh, tech companies, finance companies, gaming companies, uh, to kind of get them in and teach them like what it's like to work in a professional sort of tech environment, right? And I've found uh, with the, the group that I've been working with over the past eight months that, you know, everything that you need to learn, at least in the QA discipline, is something that I can teach you on the job, right? There's very little that, uh, uh, you know, I need you to have ahead of time. And I think for any sort of junior role, a designer or a producer, uh, even engineers to an extent, like this is stuff you can learn on the job. These programs are really, really beneficial uh, uh, for that. So um, if you've not heard of them before, definitely encourage you to check them out. If uh, you may be interested in them, check them out. They're a really good uh, group to work with. Uh, yeah, sweet. This is the, the harder one for me was, analyzing myself because I was like well I'm you know I'm a fairly I'm a fairly woke dude I kind of know what's going on I kind of do the things right but then I sort of went okay well if that was all true why do I keep interviewing white guys like what's what's going on what's what's happening and so uh, a friend of mine uh, in academia lent me uh, or recommended me I got it on Amazon uh, the radical king which is a really good book help open my eyes up to some things that I had sort of in the back of my mind, but couldn't really address, couldn't really face. Um, I learned about uh, the importance of language from a tool called Textio. This is a free uh, tool companies can use. I'll, I think companies have to pay, but you can check it out online. Um, what Textio does is it's a sort of an AI app that looks at the phrasing that you're writing down and says, hey, this phrasing appeals to like men or women or this age range or this group of people. And it helps you identify like phrases that you just thought were regular things, like actually tend to like target your audience a certain way. So that app was really, really helpful for me. There goes a table. Uh, I did not fall in it. This is not a wrestling show. So, uh, <laughs> So, um, but uh, I found Textio really good. There are other apps like it. I highly encourage you to use these sorts of tools to help yourself, to help you recognize how the things that you say and the things that you do have an impact beyond what you think they do. And the last thing is, and I know this is gonna be, this is gonna sound really silly. I, I, I know it sounds silly. I've, I know it sounds silly to everyone I've said it. The amount of interviews I've had that I've opened up by saying, hey, you know, I use he, him pronouns. Can you tell me what pronouns you like to use? Most people, right, water off their back, not a big deal. For the people who are coming into the space, especially new, who are very nervous because you're interviewing at a large multi-billion dollar gaming company, it's a very scary thing. Little bits of humanity like that 
help people feel comfortable and help you like have a really successful relationship with that person. And um, I have found that treating someone, treating someone like a real human being from start to finish uh, massively changes both your own uh, professional reputation as well as your company's reputation. Um, the persons, people that I've interviewed have gone on to recommend other positions at Zynga to their friends and have gotten people in the door. So treating people with um, that kind of respect uh, really does have uh, big, big, big benefits that pay out uh, as you're building, uh, building up and hiring a team. Um, can you next slide me? Uh, there's an animation here that will play when you click again. Yeah, there we go. Uh, yeah, so this is how I open the door. This is how you get more people inside the industry, more people making games, and more people making fun experiences for everybody to play and chill out with. And yeah, that's actually it. Uh, I think we've got a Q&A slide after this. Boom, yeah, all right. I'm gonna sit down now because I'm very fat. Test, oh, there we go. Any questions? Hey, CJ Peters, Council Kings. Yeah. So you said, you know, after the George Floyd moment, you know, you ask yourself why are you interviewing white guys, right? All the time. Mm -hmm. Did you take that to like your higher ups and was that acted upon or is it something you have to do individually to drag them along? Right, no, that's a very fair question. Um, so I think it depends on the company, how serious you take it. Obviously, uh, at, at that moment in time, it was a very common conversation across the industry, right? Everybody was looking at like, what's going on? What's happening? You know, why is this thing happening? I think some companies were more genuine about addressing the problem than others. Um, and in my experience, the most success I had was when I actually reached out to um, a lot of companies started having like uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion offices after that. I would reach out to like VPs and chiefs and like guys in that organization and be like, here's what I'm doing. Is there resources you have for me? Is there people I can talk to? Is there stuff I can do? And I, that's where I had a lot of success. So I think, you know, when I look at, if I was reaching up to like the same sort of game development structure, there was a lot of people going like, ah, I don't know what to do, you know? That same sort of social paralysis I mentioned earlier, I think, you know, affects people no matter what their job title says. Uh, but I found it really helpful to go into those offices that are, that are made to address those sorts of places and talk to them. From there, I actually would reach out to our early career folks. That's the folks who deal with like high schools and colleges and stuff like that. And I would work with them on like, hey, here's the schools I wanna talk at, here's the places I would like to help. Uh, I would mention like uh, Houston Tillotson, for example, as a place that like, if you're in an Austin game dev scenario, like you should be looking at programs at Houston Tillotson, you should be looking at those students, uh, in addition to folks from UT and um, you know ACC and all those other kind of places. So um, I find that, you know, it's game makers really want to make games and they really don't wanna mess with other stuff. And it's very easy to kind of tunnel vision onto that. And if you want like a bigger or kind of more systematic change, you have to reach outside of that comfortable game development bubble and uh, uh, hit up people you might not normally speak to. Yeah. Did, did that answer your question? Was that helpful? Cool. Any other questions? Don't be shy. Crickets, all right. That is great. We got, we got one more coming up, yeah. What's up? Part of the um, challenge in finding good talent isn't simply, uh, I guess, your outreach per se, but I think also there are some who have actually gone the step of extending training to those who might not otherwise have access to it. And I know you don't want to become your own full-blown university or training center, but how do you bridge that? I mean, or, or what do you find more effective? Because at the end of the day, it isn't just you want a body. Mm -hmm. You don't want to just virtue signal and be performative. Yeah. You want to have outcomes. Mm -hmm. And you want that talent to perform in ways that achieves desired effectives beyond just diversity for the diversity's sake. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a fair point. Um, so 
cards on the table, long ball. My plan is to retire into academia and teach all the stuff I know. So that's like my, my direct path, right? Um, but I think structurally when you, when you look at it, a few things need to happen. First off, I've worked with teachers and professors on developing curricula, right? So I'll be like, they're like, what do my students need to know? What do they need to do? What should they have at this stage of their educational journey if they wanna be a game developer? I will sit down and talk with them, right? I can't teach a class because I have to make a bunch of video games before I go be a teacher, right? But I can work with teachers. I can help them develop the curricula. I can show them the books that I've read or the books that my other you know, game dev friends recommend as like, here's, oh, you want to be a game designer, read this book. You want to be an engineer, here's this book, right? When I'm working with colleges, it's a lot more discipline specific because there's obviously engineering schools are very interested in game programming, but there's art schools who are very interested in game art and stuff like that. And you know, you're not going to have like a one size fits all solution to any sort of real human problem. You're going to have to, uh, uh, customize it a bit as they grow and figure out what they want to do and figure out what specialties they want to fall in. So, um, you know, for direct action, you know, what I can do, eventually I am going to teach this when I have certain milestones that I've met. Um, but along the way, I can absolutely share my knowledge uh, with members of the educational community. In fact, if you're in the um, IGDA, uh, the International Game Developers Association, there is an education special interest group. If you are uh, not in that group, I highly recommend you join that group and participate in conversations. Uh, it's extremely useful. There is a ton of uh, uh, educators in there that are desperate for help um, and have zero idea what the game industry is like. So I um, highly recommend joining those conversations and being a part of that as well. Like, if you're a professional in the games industry, obviously you want to make video games. That's what you want to do. You didn't sign up to be a teacher necessarily or a mentor necessarily. But, you know, when we look at this kind of um, issue, uh, which is the, the overwhelming dominance of, you know, a, a certain, uh, 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 breakup in the um, in the games industry. Let me not talk around it. The games industry is obviously overwhelmingly white and male, and the way that you address that is by going into spaces where there aren't a lot of white males and going, hey, you can go do this too, and enabling the people who are already in those spaces to pass that information along, enabling them to give training that you might not be able to give. Does that does that answer your question? Is that helpful? Right on, right on. Who's up? Who's, uh, who's next? Boom. Hey, I was wondering, um, what are the biggest challenges for creating good games, uh, and what should an inspiring game developer know about that? Good is a very loaded term in quality assurance. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I, I think the biggest hurdles that I have seen, there's obviously the technical skill set, right? So if you want to make a 3D game, you need 3D artists, you need a 3D engine. If you want to make a multiplayer game, you need people who know like peer-to-peer -peer or server, uh, server client matchmaking, you know, so there's obviously technical skill sets. The most important skill I have seen employed in my time is communication. So, uh, which I swear, I, I know it sounds corporate, I know it sounds like boring pablum, I, I get it. But I'm telling you, like, the ability to be frank and honest and professional and not take things personally, not take things as an attack, the ability to get people on the same page as you so they understand what you're trying to do, the ability to uh, be honest without being hurtful that's what actually gets things done. Um, you know, I've, I've had my own flame outs. I've had points where I've gotten really mad at somebody and I've said like, I can't work with you anymore. I can't do this. And that didn't help. That didn't improve the situation at all. Um, but learning how to uh, talk to someone and be really clear to them about like, this is what I need. This is when I need it. This is why I need it. You know, you know, sort of leveling up that sort of written and verbal skill, tremendously, tremendously important uh, if you want to lead teams to success. Um, and sort of the, the other big hurdle that I have noticed in my time is that, you know, games are an increasingly global, increasingly, um, when I started many years ago, Games were sold to pretty much white suburban kids, right? White suburban kids had white suburban parent money and they spent it on video games. And that was the market. That was the market going back to the Atari. That was the market going back to the NES. That was the market in the, uh, even into the uh, PlayStation era. Um, however, 
as gaming has become more democratized through the use of mobile phones, streaming platforms, um, you don't have the same group of people you're trying to sell a video game to. Um, you're trying to sell it to a global audience of uh, men and women and various beliefs and various uh, uh, things that they want to do. And one of the things that I've seen in the more successful studios, um, I define success as, to be clear, financially successful, everybody gets their paycheck on time, everybody like has health insurance, very boring adult stuff. Uh, but being able to like eat and go to the hospital where you need to is very important in game development. Um, but uh, the studios that have been around the longest, um, I've noticed tend to have like a really diverse group of people who are all very passionate about the game that they work on. So um, one of the things that I was, I'm really impressed about with uh, uh, several of the teams that I've worked with is you'd have people who work on like yearly annual sports titles who play the game, they work on the game for eight hours and they go home and they play the game for a couple of hours and they take the experiences that they learned from playing the game back into the version of the game they were working on. Um, and being able to have all those different voices all care about and align on the same things, like that's that's big. That's what leads to like really awesome games and a really healthy and happy team, I think. Oh, here we go. Front row, I like it. Hi, I'm Ethan. Hi, Ethan. Uh, how are you doing? <laughs> um, I am working on a research paper right now as mm -hmm. a college student on Latinx representation within video game culture. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that caught my eye in the presentation was how the quote, um, what is it? Something about white man's job. Video games are a white man's job. Right, right. And it makes me think of games such as the 2020 Spider-Man game, Spider-Man Miles Morales, how it, you know, creates a lot of great culture and discussion when it comes to Puerto Rican and Afro, African American kids, just like Miles Morales, but, you know, mm -hmm. some things are missing. Like, there's coincidentally no police cars or any cops anywhere. And it makes me think, if we're thinking of the developers and diversity coming from the de developers first, so, you know, having a diverse array of developers, is that would that be important in making a good and diverse and cultured game that's representative, or would it be more important to just get good developers who maybe should just learn the culture or do research on it more? No, that, that's an excellent question. Um, I also encourage you to check out a game, uh, I think it's uh, Infamous Second Son. It was a PS4 launch title uh, developed uh, with a, a, a crowd out up in Seattle um, with help of the native community uh, out there on the West Coast. And it has a lot of stuff that is very specific to that region that they got, shockingly, because they worked with people you know, in that culture and in that community. So. Um, on your first point, representation is important. I know it's, it's a corporate-y thing to say in modern America, but it, it, it really is. Um, one of my favorite studies of all times, and it's gonna be one of my favorite studies because I love fighting games and it's about fighting games. Street Fighter II has more diverse cultural representation than any other fighting game ever made. It represents the portion of the cultures that play it much more closer to the actual distribution of that, of that country. So if we're in the UK, there are more uh, black people and there are more uh, Mediterranean people and there are, uh, who play Street Fighter II than would play StarCraft uh, or would play uh, Quake. Um, and the study went in and found out that, oh yeah, it's because if you're you know, an Asian person, there's like Chun-Li and Fei Long and they're cool and they look sick and they do cool moves. And if you're like a white dude, there's Guile and Ken. And if you're black, there's Balrog. There's these like representations of characters who are cool and good and do fun things in the video game that is fun to play. And uh, weirdly, that, appeared, that appealed to a very diverse group of people. Um, so representation in a game matters. But I think the reason that it matters in a game studio is because it's hard for that representation to feel honest and to feel accurate without it. I think, like you pointed out with Miles Morales, yeah, it's really weird that this video game with this black main character and there's no cops. Like, that's a weird thing because they were, they were in the white man version of the game. They had side quests. So that's kind of a weird thing, right? Um, and I think that's why you really want to focus on, you know, 
if you don't have those voices inside your studio and don't empower them to speak up and have the ability to speak up and go raise their hand in an all hand and go, hey, this is kind of weird. Could we do something else? Um, or, uh, hey, this is, this is a really cool thing my team did. Can we, can we get this in? Um, you know, without that ability, I think you're going to really struggle to create diverse games that will appeal, you know, in the future, that will get the kind of player bases that, you know, video games uh, nowadays need to succeed. Taught me taking a picture for Twitter. <laughs> All right. Any more questions? Oh, way in the back and oh, in the way. front. We oh, got two. I'm going to walk it out. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'll be hanging out after this for anybody who wants to. I'll pick a couch or something. It'll be cool. Hi. Uh, do you have any advice for solo devs or very small teams that don't have a lot of uh, diversity in their team, especially if you're a single person, to still have you know, a good way to include and make games that are diversive and inclusive? Uh, yeah, reach out to people who aren't you. Um, reach out to like, uh, I really like uh, as a solo dev or small indie, uh, talk to schools, talk about, um, you know, there's kids who want to be game devs, we'll be happy to play test your stuff. Uh, UT does regular play tests, uh, definitely talk it up with them. Um, there's the, uh, uh, for those of you who are of drinking age, uh, there is the, uh, the Game Developers Beer Night, uh, which is uh, organized on Facebook. Uh, you can reach out there, there's a lot of uh, folks there who are willing to help out. Um, when you, when you don't have the ability to get someone in your team to get that voice inside, you just go to where they're at and, and put your game in front of them. And you'll, you'll often get, you know, will it be as 100% as good as if they were working right there next to you on the thing? You know, I'm not gonna pretend it is, right? But it will get you the information and the, and the sort of um, feeling that you need, I think. All right, last one. For now. <laughs> Until later. So, Talking about diversity, but also the challenges, like what do you feel like in the industry as you know, for your studio and then the studios in general, what do you feel like is the biggest change that is happening or the biggest change that needs to be made in the next few years? Um, the biggest change that's happening is people are talking about it. Um, you know, when I was, uh, when I was in, um, in the uh, early 2010s, it, it just wasn't a part of the conversation. It, it literally just, like, you would notice it, and, and I especially noticed it as um, more diverse people were hired at the studio I was working at, but it was not a thing you talked about. It was not a, like, oh, maybe we should figure out why this is happening kind of a thing, right? Um, I, I think the biggest sea change I've seen in the last three or four years is that people are talking about, oh, well, you, you want to have, you know, uh, women in your studio, you want to have um, BIPOC in your studio, like, what does that mean? What does that, what does that, you know, what do you have to do? What is that conversation you have to have? So they're really having that now, and they're going to continue to have it, I think, or I hope, at least for the rest of my career. Um, I think the biggest uh, uh, change, um, I think the biggest change that needs to happen is the way that we communicate about game development to people who aren't game developers. Um, there's this concept, uh, like I mentioned sort of in the talk, that you've got to be college educated, white, male, that's like you're starting off the gate what you got to do. Um, I, I have known engineers who have worked for 20 years in the industry who, who think less of people with a college degree because they're like, oh, you had to go to college to learn how to program. I see, you know. Um, I, I have, I have seen people who don't have a GED but are fantastic artists get hired on the strength of their portfolio and it's like, oh, you don't know how to use like Blender? We'll teach you. You don't know how to use Maya? That's fine. Like, not a problem. Um, this idea in the broader public is that games have to be made a certain way and the truth is that's never been the case. That's never been true. Um, and uh, the biggest thing we can do is to dispel that myth. The biggest thing we can do is to have something like, um, did you know in, um, I think it's 40 year old version, Steve Carell is playing a QA tester, right? Um, but uh, think about in broader media when you see games depicted, how they're depicted, who's in it, what are they doing? And 
challenge that when you see it on social media, challenge that, that perception. Um, because, you know, not only is it, is it not true, it's going back to the early days of our industry, it's never been true. Right on, right on. Right. Well, Manji. Thank you all, yeah. Yeah, thank you. I don't know if we should get both the mics together. I don't know if it'll be feedback. Right. Definitely want to uh, thank you for coming out. And I want to make sure that you get a copy of the ATX Game Makers Book of Talent. Oh, incredible. So that is uh, several pages from our community. They got together and created their own little portfolio pages in this book. Fantastic. And so whenever folks come out and say, oh, you know, I can't figure out a way to hire diversely or this, that, or the other. Well, we created a book for that. Yeah. And awesome. now you can pass that on to your friends at Zynga. Absolutely will. Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. exactly. Cool. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. And then, you know, like you said, he'll be out in the, on the floor for some extra Q&A. Yeah, so I'll be at a couch back there if you all want to talk. All right. Right on.